This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. Yeah, like I was saying too, because in Australia, the restrictions are very, very harsh. And I think at the start of it, it wasn't that I was happy, but I kind of took advantage because I'm like, you know what? I'm going to have a lot of time to do my own thing, learn a new skill, spend time with my my fiance and all this kind of stuff. But I think a year and a half later, it's like, okay, I think this is enough. It's get, it's getting to me now. I'm going to admit it. Yeah, <laughs> I believe it. You know, I think we have all had the same reaction. The same for me. When mm. First, when it started, it was kind of like, okay, we'll have some time together as a family. And we'll also, you know, I'll be able to kind of, let's say, because I wasn't traveling anymore. So I was able to invest in different venues that I, I hadn't, you know, different things that I knew that I need to put some time in, but I hadn't. And so it was actually pretty fruitful. But by now, I mean, it's not as bad here as it is there. But right now, you know, with these passports and the uh, scapegoating and all of these kind of weird political measures that are coming to the fore, it's becoming, uh, yeah, it's becoming more and more frightening, let's say, because it's also at the same time, they keep telling us, that it doesn't matter if you're vaccinated, you still have to wear your mask, you still have to social mm-hmm. distance, and there's going to be boosters, and there's new variants. And so it's as if they're going to have it all. We'll have we'll have quarantines, we'll have vaccines, and social distancing, and masks, and infinite boosters. So it's very, uh, yeah. And for a disease that kills like 0.1% of the population, I don't know. I mean, it feels like it's a little bit of a stretch and to destroy our democracies and to completely change the very the very mechanisms by which our societies function. Uh, so it seems to me like there's something else that's going on, and that it's not just about a disease. That there are other that there are other things at play uh, in this. So, ah, oh, for sure. And I, like I laugh because it's like I don't know what else to do at this point. You know what I mean? It's getting so <laughs> <laughs> it's getting so ridiculous. Yeah. And I think now more than ever it's like so much divisiveness you know what i mean like if you yeah. have a certain opinion it's like you're a piece of crap how dare you and it's very black or white communities breaking down this kind of thing so i wanted to ask you what is the symbolism behind all this like especially what's going on right now is this related to revelations or is that a stretch what's going on here um i think it depends how you look at it you know i think that it's not a stretch if you understand the book of revelation as uh as a series of patterns, you could say a series of social patterns, they kind of manifest themselves. And the idea of revelation is that it's the final version, let's say the most complete version of this pattern. But if you understand it more as these kind of symbolic patterns that it just exists in the world, then it's then in revelation, you can actually see these types of moves that happen in culture, you know, uh, the example, the example I like to give is, for example, in scripture, there's an image of a whore riding a beast. Mm-hmm. And this whore is all about mixture and about trade and about kind of con- consuming and this whole vision of, a, of, a, of, you know, that that's what a whore is, right? It's, it's just, just about pleasure and it's just about consuming. And it's just and it's all about mixture and lack of identity and all these things. And so and then it's sitting on a beast, which is interesting. And this beast is actually an image of of control of civilization because the beast is is a uh, is an amalgamation an amalgamation of all the ancient empires in scripture there's these beasts that have that represent different empires so you see like this amalgamation of empire with the whore on it um and and then in scripture it says that the beast kills the whore at some point and uh there's this whole sense that the beast sets up an image of itself and that this image brings about a kind of state of control and the idea of marking with an identity. And that when you mark, the idea of marking with an identity in a way that you can't escape. Hmm. The idea that there is no remainder. There's nothing outside of the system. The system tries to be total. It tries to be complete. And if the only thing you can do basically is if you refuse to participate in the system, then you're completely excluded, right? You can't buy, you can't sell, you can't exist, but you don't have an existence basically. And so if you understand it that way, then you can kind of see these, these, these movements towards, towards ident- uh, let's say, the idea of identification and the idea of tracking and control and the relationship 
you know, it seems like the vaccine is maybe just a door into these systems of control, which are possible because of technology. And uh, as we see this kind of coming through, then we see exactly what we see similar things to what we see in scripture, which is that right now I was just watching a video of some minister in Nigeria saying that if you're not vaccinated and you can't show proof of vaccination, you won't be able to go to a bank. You won't be able to go to church. And so oh. this is the next kind of the next step where they're like inching towards the idea that you can't participate in society at all. If you haven't received this, this, uh, this kind of sacrament of participation in oh. the, at the same time as they're telling us that the sacrament of participation isn't as good as you thought, and you're going to have to keep getting it every three, four months for, for the rest of your life. Like, I, we, I don't know, like it's all very vague, but um, so it does, it does kind of bring about, we don't have to freak out necessarily and think like, this is it, you know, but it does the, 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 so the story in scripture can help you understand these patterns. Uh, and understand this relationship between systems of control, how they mm. take over after too much freedom. You could say something is too chaotic and too too much goes too much in that direction. Then after that, a uh, system of control comes and tries to clamp it down. Mm. Yeah, it's very like like lately it's been so inverted. I feel like these times because at one stage, at least in Australia, it's completely illegal for you to go to church, but you can pay a prostitute to have sex. Like, yeah. that's fine. You know what I mean? It's like, wait, 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 wait. I thought this was all about like social distancing and all this kind of stuff. But I don't think that it's about that. No, there's something else, definitely something yeah. else going on. And people often, it's funny because people wonder, what is it? And people don't understand that power is its own motivation. There is no other secret motivation except for power. And you see that it's like the capacity for, and let's say, the capacity for power, which comes into a kind of unholy union with people's desire to feel safe and, you know, desire to, to not to not be in danger. These two things kind of go together and they, they go together surprisingly well, because the more sa the safer you are, the more afraid you are and the more you feel like you're unsafe. This is really true. You know, it was interesting because, I you know, I lived in uh, in Congo for four years. And uh, my oh, my really? wife and I and nice. my my son and I uh, my son and us we we actually lived in local neighborhoods with Congolese people you know in the city of Kinshasa you know there were no other Westerners around it was just you know so so we were we were kind of in the life and we lived through the rhythms of the life and the West like the kind of Westerners North Americans and Europeans lived in these gated compounds that had guards and had had all this and they were far more afraid than we were. Hmm. because they were so safe and they felt like this safety now all of a sudden every little danger becomes like an like this crazy thing and it's like no you're not supposed to ever be in danger you're not supposed to ever get sick you're not supposed to ever die basically uh and this is just that that's not true it's just a lie it's just a basic lie about how we exist in the world and how risk is just an integral part of being human and the less so, risk we take the more we're afraid of them yeah, I, I think that's why I really enjoy traveling, especially to third world countries and kind of just getting thrown into the unknown. You know what I mean? I think it's what I've noticed today. Those who are like the most strict about, you know, like getting the jab and lockdown, all this kind of stuff. It's usually those who haven't really stepped outside their bubble their whole life. You know what I mean? And I, I find that very interesting. Like, the, like you said, like when you feel so safe and comfortable, that's when you kind of get more afraid of getting hurt and taking risks and these kind of things. Yeah, exactly. And it's, and it really is a, you know, it just, it kind of, a, it's kind of a mode of being in which people embark. And there's something about the mother, like something about this kind of devouring mother that, that says, you know, it's like, I'm going to protect you from all danger. I'm going to make mm. sure that nothing happens to you, that you're not going to die. You're not going to get sick. You're not going to hurt yourself. And you're not also going to be in danger. There'll be no hate speech. No one's going to insult you. Nobody's going to hurt you. No one's going to hurt <laughs> yeah. your feelings. It reminds me of my mother. <laughs> she, she's like a Latina Spanish mom, so very overprotective. She's overprotective. Yeah, but it's yeah, like, yeah. I rebelled in my teenage years. So it kind of had the opposite effect of what she intended. But Oh, yeah. Uh, you were yeah. like, okay, I need to break free from this. Yeah, uh, 100%. Uh, but imagine that now at a, syst at a level of systems mm. where... You know, and people struggle to understand that there's a relationship, let's say, with the kind of 
rise in social justice mentality that was there several years ago and this desire for safe spaces, this desire to not to not be triggered, that they know that that we're fragile and that we need to be preserved in, from all kind of danger. And now this this situation with COVID is an extension, like a physical extension of something which has been a social phenomenon for quite a for quite a while now. Mm. So, is this like a start of a new age? Do you think? I just don't see us going mean, back. You know. I hope it's not a start of a new age. I mean, for sure, it does feel like something similar happened in Weimar, really, you know, because Weimar was a wild place. Like, it was a wild, crazy place. And uh, there were all this kind of, uh, let's say, fluidity in identity and fluidity in, in roles and fluidity in terms of taboos. And all of this was all kind of mixed up. And uh, at some point, when there was a crisis, then... The only thing to do was to overcompensate and to kind of clamp down and create massive systems of control. And I think that this is what we're, we're kind of seeing is that this little crisis is just becoming an opportunity for systems of control to clamp down. But, you know, I mean, it's hard not to also see that there seems to be something <clears throat> that is transnational about what's happening. Mm. There seems to be patterns which are not just about our own governments, but that seem to be kind of moving across governments, ways of speaking, even types of words people use. You know, for example, like this phrase that's now popular, the pandemic of the unvaccinated, uh, you know, <laughs> it's being used by different governments, by different authorities in different countries. And you realize that, OK, this it's not just, you know, it's like if Justin Trudeau says it and then you hear it in England and then you hear it in other countries and you realize, okay, I've also heard them say similar hmm. phrases like build back better and all these phrases that we're using. They have this kind of weird vocabulary that is transnational. Um, and so that's also kind of frightening. It is frightening to imagine that, that there are patterns which are even beyond our politics hmm. and that, and that are just going to happen. There's nothing we can do about it. Like here, the, the COVID passport in Quebec, where, where I am, I mean, it didn't, it didn't get debated in parliament. It didn't, didn't get debated legally. It, there, it was just said, like, this is it. It was just mandated completely in a, like a directly tyrannical way. And there was no mm. possible way to discuss it with anybody. There was nothing to say. It was just like, this is what we're going to do. And everybody just says, okay. He's the and same. It's like, we're not a democracy yeah. anymore. It's like, it, no. everybody's just forgotten that we're supposed to be a democracy. Protesting is illegal. So you, you can't even like voice your opinion on this stuff. So they shut you down. Yeah, well, I he, yeah, here at least crazy. yet, right now, they don't shut us down. They just don't cover it. Um, we're like, not allowed to leave the country. We haven't since March last year. Yeah, you guys, it's crazy. Like, you're not allowed to protest at all. No, nah, we're not allowed to leave. I can't leave the city. I can't leave five kilometers within my own house. I think now they did, uh, like, only one person per household can go for a walk around the block. Playgrounds shut down. Like, it's, yeah, it's pretty, I don't even know what to say about it because it's like, I think it's going to end, but then it just gets extended again and again and again. And it's like, I don't know, man. But I guess a positive out of this whole thing is that it led me to read revelations and uh, go inwards and kind of explore uh, Christianity. Because I discovered your work many years ago and I didn't even know what orthodoxy really was. Um, and it's been very mind blowing. And I've I'd, I'd really been delving deep into symbolism and I love your pop culture videos breaking down the patterns of movies and why we're so like obsessed with pop culture and stuff like this uh mm -hmm. for those listening at home maybe for those who aren't very well versed in symbolism what is symbolism and how do you distinguish that from let's say Jungian archetypes well it's a little bit related i'm not a huge follower of jung but it's it's not completely unrelated uh, the way to the best way to understand symbolism, I think, in a modern world, is to understand the the problem of complexity, which is that when you look out at the world, we see things, we see the world kind of let's say appear to us in a certain way. But if we're attentive and we think about it, we realize that every aspect of the world that we see mm -hmm. is an infinitely complex, right? From the glass that I'm drinking of, you know, to the table in front of me, to the sounds that I hear, they they like the glass that I have in my hand is is as complex as you. Like there's an in infinite amount of complexity in the glass. Like it's made of multiple, multiple parts and multiple aspects, right? Your chair is made out of multiple parts 
And so, but there's a way in which we are able to perceive unities in this multiplicity, right? And so there's a way in which unity kind of comes out of multiplicity and appears to us as a pattern, right? And so reality is necessarily patterned. Mm -hmm. For us to be able to even engage with it, we have to kind of, our consciousness has to engage with it in its patterns. And so that would be maybe the first way to understand what symbolism is, which is that there's an inevitability of patterns in the way we encounter things. Now, this is true for objects, it's true for sounds, it's true for everything, but it's ultimately true for the way in which we engage with each other. That is, we string a bunch of, of words together, or a bunch of facts together to create narratives, to create stories. And those stories need to have a pattern. And th that pattern isn't arbitrary, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an objective pattern that you can discern. And it's the same for images. It's the same for the way we remember things. So for us to remember something, we have to condense all this multiplicity into images that we can remember. So those images will also be patterned. And so the way we represent things ends up being patterned. So that's really the basis of symbolism. And the idea is that you can study that and you can understand it. And there's also a process by which you could say it this way, that the symbolism is the pattern of attention, right? It's the way that we attend to the world. And those things would grab our attention the most. And for the longest period of time will remain. And the things that we that don't get, grab our attention and that we don't remember will kind of fade away. Just like if someone tells you what happened during their day and it's really boring and no, and it's just a bunch of things that don't relate to each other, you're just going to forget it. But if someone tells you this crazy thing that happened to him and he almost fell off a cliff and then something happened and he came up, but then you're going to remember it because it's going to have something which gathers your attention. So in the same way, all the stories we've been telling each other for the millennia that we've been around, those have an almost like a like a natural selection process by which those that end up being preserved are the ones that gather our attention the most. So that's why you can look at fairy tales and mm. religious stories and myths as containing more of these condensed patterns than let's say just the common reality in which we exist. But the common reality in which we exist is also pattern. It's just not as distilled as these patterns. And so in the mm. same manner, the way we interact with each other is also pattern, right? You speak, I speak, we kind of have a way to listen to the other person, to show them we're listening, and we have to follow that pattern or else communication breaks down. But then that also scales up into rituals like handshakes, like saying hello, you know, like mm -hmm. smiling. And then ultimately that scales up into something like religious rituals where we all gather together, we act in communion, we act together towards something which transcends us, and then that binds us as a community. So we can understand everything from fairy tales to let's say, to, to, to uh, liturgy, to Christian liturgy or to architecture with these patterns of this kind of symbolic patterning. Hmm. And are these patterns or symbolism, uh, is it religious in nature? Like, well, it's not, it's, I would say you could say yes and no. That is, yeah. it isn't religious in nature if you, you it's just reality. Right? It's yeah, just yeah, the yeah. way that reality lays itself out. But you could say that at the, at, a, a most basic level, reality does present itself in a religious manner. That is, even if you understand what religion, the word religion, religion means means bringing together, means binding together. That's what religion, connecting things together. That's what religion is. And so it ends up being the ultimate types of, of patterns move towards religion because they end up being, let's say, recognizing how these patterns bind us together and then looking up towards them. You could say consciousnesses, it's not just even pattern, even consciousness has this pattern. And so you have something which binds the community together, they recognize it, they celebrate it together, they sing songs about it, you know, they, they, they end up giving things to it, you know, and so then you have the image of the king or the image of a god and the image of, of, of these heroes that we venerate from antiquity. And so it ends up, it does end up looking religious in its kind of ultimate uh sphere but it it scales all the way down to like i said a handshake or uh yeah or just kind of simple social rituals so so are these patterns something that we recognize in our own minds or is the pattern a more fundamental reality well this is where it becomes tricky because there's a there's a 
even today, like in modern physics right now, you know, they have this whole observer problem and they have, they have this sense. A lot of scientists even now are coming to the sense that somehow consciousness is necessary for reality to kind of present itself because mm -hmm. or else without that, we have something like quantum fields or just, just this kind of possibility of existence. And so you can't completely disassociate mind from the manner in which reality becomes pattern because it is kind of an invisible pattern which manifests itself in, in, in reality. So you can't completely distinguish it. The problem we have is that since, let's say, since romanticism and since, you know, kind of modern philosophy, we tend to somehow think that mind is subjective in the sense of idiosyncratic and like, you know, relative to you, like relative to your opinion, let's say. Yes. Yeah, that's not that's not true. They say there's mm. there's something objective about mind and the the way in which these patterns present themselves to us. Uh, and in that in that objectivity, then we can kind of recognize them. We don't just recognize them; we participate in them, and that's really important to see the difference mm. also between a kind of symbolic understanding and a more modern rationalistic uh, abstract way of understanding. The modern rationalist tends to abstract themselves from the world and think they're, they don't exist, or they're just this like floating being that's looking at the world and then they analyze it. Whereas in, when you understand this patterning, you realize that no, you're in the world and you're kind of recognizing and participating and celebrating these patterns rather than this kind of cold, uh, cold cynical, uh, not cynical, but like just cold analysis of, uh, of, of science, let's say. Mm. Do you think it's possible to step outside the patterns no. and the world no well, that's, what, that's yes. what a lot of yes, a lot of I gurus think, claim so <laughs> yeah so i think so well, like uh, you could say that yes mm -hmm. um but how do you so, know so but it would be something like a spiritual like a spiritual experience i think that you can have a kind of transcendent spiritual experience but mm -hmm. that transcendent spiritual experience will then when it comes back down right so let's say you have a a, a theophany and you see something you see, like you not see with your eyes, but like you have an, an intuition, this pure intuition of something which is beyond uh, multiplicity. And like as soon as you turn back and you even think about it or even represent it in your mind or you, you even talk about it or you frame it, then it comes back into the world of patterns. Mm. Does that make sense? Like yeah. it immediately comes back into the world of patterns. And so, uh, so that's why you can recognize, uh, like this, I think, you can recognize a, a, a fake spiritual person from a real spiritual person when the fake spiritual person tends to want to destroy the world. And so mm. they go, they say they had this kind of spiritual experience. And then what they do is they say, then they try to relativize everything. It's like, I had this spiritual experience and then everything else is crap. Like nothing Yes. All of this is nothing, right? Whereas I think the real kind of spiritual insight is able to see that this is the source of the patterns. This invisible transcendent point is the source of the patterns. And so is able to kind of gather them into their experience. There's a there's a beautiful image in the in a mystical, a Christian mystical book called The uh, The Life of Moses by St. Gregory of Nyssa. Okay. Haven't read where St. Gregory of Nyssa describes Moses ascending the mountain mm. in order to encounter God in the in the divine darkness, like even beyond light into this kind of ultimate, ultimate transcendent space where even, let's say, even vision disappears and you, you enter in this kind of pure being, let's say, or pure beyond being. And so mm. as he goes up the mountain, he removes all these layers, you know, of like his sandals and he kind of removes this quantity and becomes purified as he enters into this kind of transcendent space. But then when he gets there, he's given the pattern of the tabernacle. He's given the pattern of the space of worship. And so, and in that pattern, he sees all the things he dropped as he was going up, right? He sees these layers, he sees these garments of skin, he sees these actions. And so that's the idea is that if you really atten attain these kind of high spiritual states, then you, you should be able to gather into them the multiplicity and see multiplicity as an expression of these high spiritual states. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense to you. 
No, no, it definitely does. I think it's important to reconcile these worlds because uh, I I fell into the kind of new age non-dual. Tra- I mean, it's not even real non-duality, really, because what I found out is that Orthodox Christianity is a form of non-duality because non-duality just means non, not two. Uh, but yeah, I did find this kind of this path that a lot of people go down uh, in spirituality where they basically try to dissolve the world. You know what I mean? They call it yep. all illusory. It's all relativistic. But what I've experienced is absolute truth. So it's like this dialectical tension. Like you're saying one thing, but then you're acting in a way that's not really congruent to what you're actually <laughs> speaking. So you can't really live and act in the world that you're you're speaking about. And what do you, what are your thoughts about this? Like this kind of the the blind leading the blind, false prophets, yeah. new age spirituality. Why is this so popular? And I understand it because I, I went full force into it as well and got a bit well, shaken I think, up. <laughs> well, let's say, first of all, to give, you know, as we say, to give the devil its due or to, to kind of understand what happened is that yes. Christianity became extremely superficial. Oh, yeah. You know, from the time of the Enlightenment, as it slowly moved, let's say, towards the 20th century, there was this, this there was an extremely kind of superficial and almost materialistic uh version of christianity and And what do you what do you mean by that how did it turn materialistic well it became very moralistic first of all it tended to discount mystical experience it tended to be legalistic right into this kind of protestant idea that you're declared saved and it's this kind of uh it's kind of it's almost like a legal declaration of your salvation and it doesn't change anything really but it's like when you die you go to heaven like all this kind of nonsense you know so if you believe in jesus you're done you don't have to exactly really do much work that's what spirituality is to you it's like you just believe in jesus and you're saved but i mean but boom and that's it that's it like i don't know what that is like i I, it doesn't mean anything (laughs) you know so i get it right i understand and then also the this this want, this desire to kind of embrace uh, scientism, let's say, in Christianity, and then trying to kind of defend scripture in a scientific way and defend Genesis as a scientific narrative and defend all these stories in a, in a historical scientific way and debasing them so much that they just, people didn't understand the spiritual significance of these stories anymore. They would argue about some stupid statuette that they found in the desert in Palestine but then they didn't understand what it even meant for Moses to go up the mountain and encounter this divine uh, transcendent uh, experience and then come down with his face shining in glory. Like, do you understand what that's referring to? Or do you just see it as a material phenomenon that happened, right? So this is the problem that, that happened. And so as the scientism and this kind of materialism t- took shape and Christians tried to keep up and tried to stay materialist at some point, just shattered. And then all of these stories just seem like a bunch of silly, stupid stories. Like, why would it matter that some guy got nailed on a cross 2,000 years ago? Like, that <laughs> saves you. Like, some guy gets nailed on a cross, and then you're going to heaven. Like, really? Is that the story? Yeah, that didn't, that didn't make sense to me either. Right. It's like, is <laughs> that up. the story? Like, yeah. dude, it is, it's just total nonsense, right? And so it's like, so I get it. I understand why at some point people, and you see it, like, you see it even before the modern world. You see these um, kind of esoteric, uh, these esoteric groups and these esoteric uh, ideas start to appear even in the 17th century. You know, you see with the Rosicrucians and then moving into kind of Blavatsky and the Theosophists, kind of, you have this kind of opening up and Crowley and all these occultists in the 19th century. So you kind of see this this reaction, let's say to this materialist, moralistic uh, Christianity and then that kind of wins, you could say, in the 60s, especially that side of the of this of this kind of uh, conflict wins. And then there's this explosion of kind of wild mysticism and all these explorations yes. of all these other traditions and a mixture and, and like being, you know, going to India to find some guru and then yep. being fascinated by anything except your own your own tradition um and also like the individualism of the modern world kind of seeped into there and so it became very idiosyncratic all the everybody has their own thing and everybody has their own mixture of stone of like you know crystals and these different right. practices and spiritual buffet. Or whatever it's all these things yeah um and so i get it i get it but i think that it's important to kind of be able to notice that it's it's participating in the breakdown of our societies, right? So you have all these idiosyncratic spiritualities that don't coalesce, that don't kind of come together 
or they do as a cult. So it's either you're totally idiosyncratic or you kind of give yourself completely to this guru that usually lasts a few years and then it collapses and there's all these scandals that come out. And, and, and so it's a, just kind of this, this, it's a very disturbing situation. And one of the things that makes it even more disturbing is really the obsession with the strange. That is the idea that my own story is worthless and I can't see any value in it, but I can read some like weird tantric text from, from some culture that I have nothing to do with that has a caste system that I don't participate in that has, that has all these realities that I can't at all understand, but I find it super interesting and super fascinating and, and really, uh, uh, kind of, uh, I feel like it reveals something to me. Uh, so my, yeah. like, let's say my take on that or my approach to that has rather been to say, okay, let's go back into our story and let's try to go back and find find what was there before the, the breakdown, find what was there before things started to fall apart. And that's what we see in in the mystics. Like you read, like I talked about St. Gregory of Nyssa, there are these amazing texts written in the, in the early uh, centuries of Christianity, which have everything of anything that a new ager would want in terms of this kind of cosmic understanding and this mystical union with something transcendent. It's all there but it doesn't have to break down into all these kind of uh, individualistic idiosyncrasies that people participate in um, and leads them, leads them into all these strange directions, you know? Yeah. I, I think I can understand the allure. I think with new age spirituality, especially with the, you know, the, the understanding of the 19th, 20th century of Christianity, that materialistic surface level Christianity you were talking about. And I can see why people get so attracted to that Eastern mysticism side, because you can have that direct mystical experience. It's a lot more, I guess, entertaining, you know, a lot more explorations kind of scratches that curiosity button. Uh, and, but like you said, early Christianity, like orthodoxy, it's got all of that mysticism stuff. It's just that we didn't, we didn't know. And a lot of people who are very against, let's say Christianity, like Protestantism or Catholicism aren't even very aware of orthodoxy and like no. what early church fathers were teaching. Exactly. And not only that, but there's been an effort in the past few hundred years to iron over in, even in the Bible, that is even in the Bible translations, there's been a, a concerted effort to iron over anything that smacks of something strange or something that doesn't, that, hmm. that, that modernists can't deal with. You know, and so, for example, like this whole idea of this hierarchy of angels and all of these kind of sons of God that are in the council of the divine and and uh, and kind of manifest yes. God's will in the world. You know, that's something that people have just been trying to chase out of Christianity for several hundred years uh, and kind of to their detriment, because now people are interested everybody's interested in angelology and everybody's like encountering all these different angels, but they have no way of discerning what they're encountering that's completely chaotic. And they think that just because they have an encounter with the being that somehow this is meaningful and not, and, and it's like, so they don't have a map to kind of function in this world of intermediary spirits, but mm. that's all, it's all there. It's there in scripture. It's there in the tradition. It's there in the iconography of Christianity where you do have a kind of map of this intermediary world. And there are ways to kind of encounter it health in a healthy way without, you know, ending up following some some strange being that you encountered on ayahuasca and then you and then it takes you on down a very dark uh rabbit hole and you find yourself in psychic trouble you know after a little while where all of a sudden you start to break down as oh a, as yeah a i've been there man i've been there uh, <laughs> it's scary, scary stuff uh I, I think the having grounding is really important especially like strong scaffolding i think mm. when you just get catapulted into these realms sometimes it's hard to close those doors, you know, once opened. Yeah. And the thing with doors is that it's a two way street. Exactly. It's not, it's, <laughs> it's not just you entering the spiritual That's realm. Real. It's also the spiritual realm entering your, if you believe in that. And I, I definitely, I find it hard not to believe in, that there is a spiritual war out there yeah. and there are principalities. So like, what, what are your thoughts on this? Like pre less spiritual war, good versus evil. How do you reconcile dualism is it two independent forces like how, how do you 
how do you go well, about this? This is an interesting, there's an interesting um, way to kind of understand that, which is that there is a kind of duality, let's say, and the duality is due to the fall. Like no matter how you kind of understand it, mm -hmm. if you look at the story of Adam and Eve, that's what you see. You see that they're in a, in a kind of balanced space or in this garden that is kind of a balance between culture and nature. That's a balance between masculine and feminine that has this, this balanced reality. Uh, it's not perfect, right? And there's a remainder in it, which is this kind of serpent. And then this remainder tempts them into duality, tempts them into seeing duality as final. But duality exists, right? It exists in the world. And so that's the fall. The fall is, kind of, is this fall into kind of extreme duality. And so you can see it in the human, in the human world as this kind of good and evil and these kind of dualities. But you can also see it in the cosmic sphere as these two sides, like you said, the angels and the demons are these two sides of a, of a great cosmic story. But there's also a manner in which the, these principalities ultimately are resolved in God. And so there's a, there's an interesting uh, quote from the, from the, I think it's from St. Greg, Gregory Nazianzus, who he talks about the angels of the left hand, right? That there are the angels of the right hand, and then there are the angels of the left hand. The angels of the left hand of God are, are basically the demons. And the demons think that they're doing their own thing but they don't realize that they're not, that they're actually ultimately doing the will of God in kind of showing us our own, let's say, uh, weaknesses and manifesting these, these weaknesses and this darkness in the world so that that darkness can then be covered by God ultimately in the final, okay. in the final image, you could say. It sounds um, like it relates a little bit to Jungian shadow integration, a little bit. There's something of that, but in the difference bit. I would say with the shadow integration is that we really don't, we don't see Christianity that's really important. Christianity doesn't see uh, darkness or doesn't see sin as a positive force. Yes. It's a, it's a, uh, what it, what it is, it's a kind of, um, it's something not in its right place or something not looking in the right direction. That's what sin is. And so being is always positive, like being is always true. But then there's an there's a way in which it can become out of whack by, let's say, attracting too much attention to itself or not being in the right place. And so that is the way in which we kind of understand. So that's the kind of the joke about the demons is that they think that they're dark, but ultimately they'll participate in the greater light, you could say, without without even understanding what they're doing. Hmm. You know, so it's not just that it's not that that God is integrating non-being let's say or or, or or this kind of lack of, of being but rather that he's revealing the way in which things actually do participate in the great in the great picture um i don't know that that makes sense so it's kind of like the image of christ like you have this image of uh of christ going when christ dies you know there's this kind of uh, more mythological version of the story in the in the gospel of um of nicodemus where you know you have the devil and hades in in hell and they're like, we won, right? We killed the son of God. Like, this is it. You know, we finally did it. And they're, they're like excited because here he comes, right? We're going to bring him into death. But then they don't realize that if you bring light into darkness, right? It's not, it's not light that goes away. It's, you do the opposite. And so bringing, you know, God into death was actually kind of revealing the, revealing the world and kind of scattering that darkness. Mm. Well, it's even like the, a physical example of, a candlelight, you know, no matter how much darkness there is around it, it can't actually overpower and overconsume it. No, exactly. That's the, and the, that's a good, the, the, and the phrase you used is exactly the phrase that St. John uses in the gospel, right? He says the, you know, the darkness did not know it, but it, it didn't, it couldn't overpower it because like you said, that's not how light and dark work. You know? mm. And, and it seems even in pop culture or, or actually forever, we've been obsessed with the story of good versus evil and the hero's journey and all this kind of stuff. And I remember listening to an old podcast of yours and you talked about the hero's journey and how ultimately it's Christ's story. And that before Christ, there really wasn't at least the version of the hero's journey that is out today. Is that true? And can you like get into that? I mean, I think so. I, I think yeah. that, cause one of the things people talk about is like the dying and rising God, that there are all these ancient stories of these right pagan gods that, that that point towards ultimately this kind of story of death and resurrection uh but i think they're 
I think they're kind of, how can I say this? I think they're looking back from a Christian point of view into something which maybe didn't have the same type of hierarchy that they think it did. That it was, it was these scattered, these you could say these scattered lights that were in the world. But then from the story of Christ, then we can look back into rea- into the past. And then all of a sudden we see these little sparking lights that are pointing towards ultimately what is the story of Christ. And so the idea of going into the underworld, right? This descent into the underworld, that's the story that you see uh, in the hero's journey, but that you also see just, in so many stories, or you see it in the Iliad, you see it in in, um, in so many myths, you know, you see it uh, in the Aeneid, all of these, these stories have this kind of descent into Hades, and then either you encounter someone, you encounter your father, and then your father reveals something to you, or you go there to get someone, right? Uh, you have... Um, you have the story of, I think it's Hercules who goes down into Hades and is able to save his friend out of, out of death. And so you have these like these little versions of this kind of going into death and bringing out, you know, kind of revealing something that you wasn't, that death wasn't able to, to hold on to, you could say, or yeah. finding something precious hidden in death, like going into death and then finding some, some vision that will give you meaning. Right. And so, so it's there, right? It, it is there, but as you, once the story of Christ happens, then that story is, it reaches its limit. Like there's no, there's actually no other story you could say after the story of Christ, because in the fullness of the story of Christ, you have this idea that Christ does that, right? Christ goes into death. He doesn't just go into death, right? He actually dies. He dies, he goes into death. And then when he goes down there, he gathers everybody that's there and takes them out. Wow. And so, yeah. right, we have this this sentence that we hear every Easter in the Orthodox Church, where it says, you know, Hades, hell is empty. Hmm. Like hell has been has been emptied by Christ. Christ went down and brought all. I mean, it's mysterious. It's not. It's hard to kind of completely understand it. But it, it is this image that Christ defeated death itself, and that by going into the underworld, when he came back out, you know, that was it. And so hmm. there's no. The, it's like I said, it's the limit of the story. So you go down into the underworld, you solve the underworld, and then you transform it into glory, and then that's it. Like there's no, there's no version which can go beyond, let's say, that version in terms of categories. <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually it's a very obviously a, a story an archetype that resonates with so many people, you know. Yeah. And even something like I did want to talk a little bit actually about Lord of the Rings because one one of my favorite movies, and it's obviously a movie that just exploded in popularity and then i found out years later that you know the author is a devout catholic so it's got deep christian symbology and i feel like a lot of people don't even notice but then they they become super religious about lord of the rings even atheists which i find quite ironic uh why why do you think lord of the rings connected with so many people and like what are the main kind of powerful symbolism behind that well i think that i mean what token was able to do is to really reinstate a you could say an ancient vision of reality, an ancient uh, cosmic image. And because maybe because he did it in fiction, people didn't feel threatened by it, maybe something like that. And so because of that, they were able to just be seduced by it, you could say. And so people, you know, the most materialistic nerd, scientific, you know, (laughs) programmer guy will just fall in love with Lord of the Rings and yeah. he don't doesn't totally understand why. If you ask him about religion, he'll say religion is stupid, it's superstitious, it's 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 all these things. But nonetheless, he he is able to be completely kind of engaged and subsumed by this story, which has this this entire kind of hierarchy of beings that you know that moves from I mean, in the Lord of the Rings himself, doesn't necessarily talk about the, the first god, but like it, it kind of moves down at least in in the Middle Earth through the elves and then the humans and then the the dwarves, you know, and then the orcs, and so you have this this kind of movement from from light and kind of immortality into this kind of monstrous uh, darkness, which is at the bottom of the world. And in the movie, they capture it so well, like they just do it so well because they have the oh, old yeah. guy like coming out of the earth, you know, and they're all like filled with the, they're all scummy and dirty and, oh, and that music yeah. as well so ominous yeah, exactly so it's good. very it's super well done <laughs> yeah. and so because of that people just feel like it's right even though it's completely silly for a materialist to think about elves and orcs and dwarves and all of these all of these uh tropes they're they're because they're patterning themselves 
on just like kind of a traditional image of angels above and demons below and the men in the middle and the king and you know the uh the, the these kind of prophet uh priestly figures like gandalf that have more wisdom and they're able to kind of manifest it to us like you know all of these tropes and also the fall with Gollum, who becomes obsessed and then be- mm. and then turns into comes closer to the orcs you could say you know becomes demonized because he's obsessed with 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 something which can which can kind of give him power and so it's like we totally recognize these tropes but they're really really just tropes right they're really they're really uh they're re- it's really a religious story um but it's great because it, it it's actually for people that are attentive to it they can say well you know like i can i can talk to you about the story that's in the bible in a similar way because it's way more than lord of the rings like the story of the Bible is 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 way more has way more complexity and subtlety and has all these layers in it and and all these patterns playing themselves out in different forms than Lord of the Rings um, because of that it's actually harder sometimes because it's so big that it's hard to it's hard to it's, kind of fully get what's going it's, it's on. It's very overwhelming sometimes. I'll open scripture. I'm like, Whoa, man, this is yeah, like exactly. so much. What through. am I reading? Yeah. Like, you just fall onto some weird thing, especially if you open the old one bite at a time. <laughs> yeah, so like some like weird law about not mixing, you know, a donkey and a cow while you're yeah. plowing your field. And like, what are all these stupid things? Uh, how, do you, how do you reconcile this, man? You know, that, yeah. that's why I I got the Orthodox Study Bible, so that really helped kind of fill in the gaps a little bit. You know, not pretending like yeah. I I understand scripture. Of course not. I'm still an infant, but definitely saved me some time. Uh, but it's funny what you're saying about Lord of the Rings, you know, people get so, I would even go as far to say that religious about it, you know what I mean? Like the nerds are like crazy about it. And it's funny how like we even use it in our language now. Like if you go on an epic adventure, it's like, all right, we're going on a Lord of the Rings adventure, you know, or if you, instead of using the word hell, we're like, oh man, I went down to Mordor last night and just yeah. got devoured by orcs. You know, it's just like things like, it's just funny how we use it in our language. And it's like, it's metaphorical, but it also kind of reflects this very fundamental pattern of reality, you know, yeah. that we... And the movies were really know. successful, I think, in terms of visuals. They really oh, captured... It still holds up. Of, it still holds yeah, up today. It holds up. So I watched it just a few months ago, too, with my kids, because they hadn't seen it yet. And uh, yeah, it just, it really does hold up in terms of the this this kind of world that exists and, and these different characters uh you know yeah it it it, it does pretty well <laughs> uh, i was reading a few months ago i was actually reading your your brother's book on the symbolism of genesis and i kind of wanted to unpack that just a little bit maybe for those especially who aren't too well versed in these topics but uh before getting into genesis i want to know what is the difference between this literal and symbolic interpretation of scripture like how should we even approach this thing because i get that question a few times like all the time you take yeah. it literally or do you take it metaphorically and it's always we live in a very dialectic culture you know it's yeah. always it has to be this or that is it one or is it zero like what, what's your answer for this well my answer is that i just cut through all that crap like i i, I don't <laughs> like those i don't like that opposition i i find yeah. that it's a it's a dishonest opposition because mm-hmm. if you remember the way that i talked about what symbolism is like symbolism is the actual pattern by which you're able to attend to something. So it's so so it's actually it's so it's the pattern of a story. It's the pattern of an image. It's the pattern because let's say you take the story of of Christ. You know Christ. Mm-hmm. I don't know Christ uh, at the wedding of Cana. You know there's a million things that were happening in that event. There were indefinite amount of things happening at the same time in that place, and notwithstanding around it. Right. It's like there was, you know, there's crinkled in, in, in his robe. There was, you know, dirt on his sandals. There was there's a million like billions and billions of things happening. And so in order for you to be able to attend to what was happening and to get meaning from it, you have to condense those facts into a narrative. You have to choose facts and then you have to string them together in a way that I will recognize th- that this is a unit. And so even the literal meaning of a text is already symbolic hmm. it's already, it's necessarily symbolic because why did we why are we talking about this rather than that why am i mentioning these facts and why am i putting them together in a narrative that i can recognize and so there is no neutral reality there is no neutral meaningless reality that's just there 
And then on top of that, I add some metaphorical meaning. That's just total nonsense. Uh, like this right? There's already form. a reason why that story is there. There's a, there's a reason why the story is constructed the way it is and that those facts have been chosen to be sequenced in that manner. And so the meaning is already there at the very first la layer, right? And so the best way to understand it is that what you would think as literal just means that you're very paying very close attention to what the text is saying, right? That's even what literal means. Literal means literature. It means what's written. Hmm. That's what literal used to mean. It means what's written. And so you, you pay attention to what's written. You have what's written there. And then what's written there is structured in a way that is analogically related to other things. And then that's when what you would call the metaphorical meaning will appear to you, which is that as you look at the pattern of the story, you realize that it's structured in a way that is similar to your experience, that's similar to a society, that's similar to another story in scripture, and then a, a story from mythology. And so then you, that's when you get what maybe what people call the metaphorical meaning, which is that I can take a story in scripture, which is already symbolic, which is already patterned in a cosmic way. And then I can say, this is similar to your experience. And then I'll apply it to your experience. But it's actually similar to the way Tolkien understood storytelling because Tolkien hated metaphorical meaning. He said, yeah. he said my, it, my stories are, don't have metaphorical meaning. And people don't understand what he meant. And he said, he said, they're not metaphorical, they're applicable. And so he said, you can apply my stories to things, but they don't, it's not like, you know, the orcs are the communists and, and th this aspect of the story is some other political thing. And then yeah. this is means technology and this, is, it's like, that's the wrong way of looking at the Bible. And it's, it's the wrong way of reading Tolkien too. It's, a, it's mostly that the pattern of the story of Tolkien can be applied to your experience or applied to a situation, and then you can use it as a lens to see the world. And so that's the way in which scripture is metaphorical. Hmm. But you won't find like the idea of literal, the way that people think of literal, that is a neutral telling of a story that is completely without meaning is absolute nonsense. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said before, so I think we live into a polarizing society and it's very, people are very dialectic. On both the material side of things and even the the kind of spiritual absolutist yeah. person who you know like the materialists will deny anything that's spiritual and ground their reality from everything below and then the spiritualist will deny matter altogether yeah and say everything is one what does that even mean what's what's everything is one i, I don't think this... people who say that and also people who talk about non-duality I used to say it too, it, and, then, all, and then I realized, cool. looking back, I'm like, wait, that, that actually doesn't make any. Comp nobody, but nobody, nobody dares believe in non-duality. At least the way they think they do, they think they believe in non-duality, and you're like, you believe in non-duality, really? Do you eat your feces? No, you don't eat your feces. So don't tell me you believe in non-duality. What are you talking? What are you even talking about? Like, why does eating your crap relate to <laughs> non-duality? Well, because you don't eat your crap because you believe in duality. Hmm. You believe that some things are outside and some things are inside and you don't mix them together. Hmm. Right? That's that's because you believe in duality. You know, you you live in a house, you wear clothes, you you ha you 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 function in duality constantly and you experience duality and you live with duality and you don't if you if you believe in absolute non-duality in the way that especially people want and especially in the way that relativizes everything, then and there are like there are there you can find traditions that are cannibals and you can find traditions that that break all the taboos but i'm not sure many people are willing to go there because it's actually very destructive you know these kind of weird tantric traditions are very destructive to reality you know people most people don't want to destroy reality they're lying when they say they do because they actually exist they, they exist they have a life they have all these things and so and so the idea is that love is a better expression like love is a better way to understand it because love has the notion of of ultimate non-duality in the sense that we all participate in the life of the infinite god but we're not we don't it doesn't mean that everything is relative and everything is illusion mm. it means that because god loves us then we all exist at the level that we do it's as if god's infinite love also kind of 
let's say, moves out of himself into this multiplicity as he's gathering it back into himself. So it's not just like either everything is an illusion and we're all just, you know, we're all just Brahma. Like we're all just drops in the, the you know, the, 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 this kind of vast, like infinite consciousness. Uh, it's rather like a balance between unity and multiplicity, right? A, a, an understanding that multiplicity exists that it does, but that ultimately for it to even exist, it has to participate in the oneness. Um, but when people just say things like it's all one or whatever, like John Lennon and, and that kind of nonsense, right? It's like, <laughs> we could all be as one. What are you, what are you talking about? It's just, it's just, it's just, uh, just posturing. Imagine there's <laughs> no heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Man. <laughs> that's one of my least favorite Does that tick you off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. He has some good stuff though. I, 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 yeah, I don't really. I mean, I like the Beatles. Everybody likes it. No one, everybody. Yeah, who who doesn't Beatles. like the Beatles? Yeah, who exactly. Doesn't like the Beatles, but uh, that song in particular. Yeah, but it, it's it, it's ironic because like you're talking about these people who claim to have this absolute experience and that God is absolute. Everything and literally every single par particle in the universe is God. Everything in physical reality is just an illusion. But then they're basing their experience of the absolute from a relativistic subjective experience so it's like this kind of i don't know it's just this weirdness because you're claiming absolute reality but through a subjective lens anyway so that you can't really escape that that duality you know what i mean there's so much wrong like if you really if you really had an experience that that there's only the absolute and all its manifestations are are complete illusions you know what you would do you would shut up because why are you speaking? What are you saying? Yep. It's, it's all, that's why, that's why you realize that there's just a nonsense to a lot of the, a lot of this type of posturing that you hear in kind of, in this kind of modern uh, spiritualist, uh, you know, reality. Um, and it's not like you don't encounter texts like that in the traditions. Like there are, there are texts or there are traditions would do kind of, try to point to the manner in which, let's say, compared to the infinite, like that the infinite is something which is beyond duality, that the, that the infinite does kind of empty itself and, and contain everything at the same time. And there's an, an, a language of aporia, which people use to, to talk about that. And you see that in the, in the even in, in, in religious traditions. But like I said, this also has to coexist with all the more buffered versions of that in which we also do participate, in which we do go to church, we kneel, we sing, we burn incense, we, we do all of these celebrations, you know, and we don't just have this one, this kind of esoteric vision of the infinite that destroys reality. Mm. Because that's the, that's the problem with a lot of this, with a lot of this stuff is that people just say mysterious things they just say you know that kind of stuff like you know the universe is in a grain of sand and the grain of sand is the whole universe and you're like really is that really you really think that i don't think you do i think you're just <laughs> bullshitting me <laughs> get those social media likes people like to like to hear that yeah stuff. they like that kind of that kind of fluffy stuff yeah it's funny because like I, I started off doing new age stuff but i i feel like because I'm Australian, I have that kind of inherent down to earth, casual sort of yeah. relationship with it. So I think it wasn't as new age hippie, but I think <laughs> as I got more grounded over time, uh, people weren't very happy with mm. me. Because, and it's really, uh, yeah. Well, it's something that I, I question because I, I find it weird how in this kind of world, there is no word for pre-list. There is no word for, false spiritual experience and even that is very triggering because like how yeah. dare you say that my experience was false it felt so overwhelmingly real and i've had many of those and i'm not even saying that it's false or it's true but the fact that there is no discernment between the yeah. two how do you No, but it, we know? don't have to question the experience people have you know it's yeah. mostly it's mostly the like you said the discernment of that experience and so you know in the orthodox tradition i think it I think they have the really good way of dealing with this, which is basically saying you should ignore all spiritual experiences. And I know people are going to go like, what? Just ignore spiritual experiences. But that's the, that's what they say. And the reason why they say that is because they realize that if you really believe 
even what a new age will say, which is something like, you know, the purpose of reality is to be united with the one, right? To be, to kind of be united with the transcendent uh, reality. Then if that's your purpose, then that's what you should be aiming towards. And then these spiritual experiences that you have, that's not it, right? Just because you see an angel or you have some feeling or you have some insight, even if the insight is true to a certain extent, that's not your goal. That's not where you're headed. So you have to be careful not to, not to give too much attention to that because you're going to, uh, you're going to stay there and you're going to kind of turn around in these, like, these kind of experiences. Uh, and so if you just ignore the experiences, then there's less of a danger of being, you could say, seduced by a demon, you know, mm. or seduced by something which is off key because you're just, you're just kind of, and you will have the spiritual experiences, right? You will, but you just don't, you don't spend your time on them and you don't, uh, you don't wallow in them. You could say you rather keep your eye on the ultimate goal, which is, you know, which is the union with the divine. Yeah. Yeah. And even test your experience, you know, and see if it, holds up over time if it still makes cohesive se sense with the rest of your conception of yeah and know. also the fruits you know yeah, the fruits, I said, exactly. you know what you'll know a tree by its fruits that is that if you have these spiritual experiences but you're a total jerk to everybody around you and and it's like and you continue to to, to have all these sins in your in your life and all these things that are your obsessions and your you know your idiosyncrasies then that spiritual experience is pretty meaningless Mm. Like it might have felt real and it probably was real, but it's not moving you towards freedom. It's not moving you towards something which is which is more than just a kind of uh, like a, like an entertaining experience, you could say. Yeah, uh, uh, that's why integration is so important, like the work that you do afterwards. It's like kind of reading a book and not contemplating, you know what I mean? It kind mm. of will just go right through your head, except that it's a little bit, it can be a bit more dangerous, obviously, going into these realms and let's say reading a book yeah uh, but definitely. i think I, I think a lot of it has to do with like naivety like you know what i mean just overly trusting i found that mm -hmm. the people who are the most trusting uh navigating through these spiritual realms without actually taking it seriously are like usually yeah just kind of young white hippie western people uh who've never really i don't know because I, I grew up i've had some like kind of rough experiences and i've met people during my teenage years like who are very charismatic and they're very actually good looking and, and handsome and very, you know what I mean? Like they know how to talk to you and make you feel good. Mm -hmm. But then you find out later that they're actually a snake. But you can see them go out in the rest of the world, like people being like, oh, he's such a nice person. But then when mm -hmm. you actually peek behind the curtain, you're like, yeah, I know that guy. Johnny's a dick. Don't trust him. Yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. So there's a lot of, yeah, that, yeah. that makes, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think, you know, I think there's also a, an aspect of materialism, which is part of that, which is that because we've been so hounded and we're hounded in school and we're told that the world is just a bunch of phenomena that can be calculated and be and be measured, is that when people have an insight that there's actually something more, then it's like whatever that more is, they're all excited about it and they just want to dive in and they want to experience. So it's like, like you said, it also the materialism leads to this lack of discernment as well because it's like oh wow there's this whole world that that they lied to me about that actually does exist and so it's like open the doors open and it's like oh there's yeah. something there's something it's like this fast you know everybody's just excited <laughs> about it but it's like no no wait a minute no no that's a that's a really bad thing like that's a demon and that's actually a projection of your passion and that's a it's like and so but it's at first people don't they don't have that capacity because they're used to be complete materialists. And so that's probably one of the problems that we have too. You know, it's yeah, I, I, I relate. I went through that too. Um, yeah. and it, it would even, maybe even some people listen to this right now might be triggered for when people even say, Oh, it's a demon. Like, Oh, right. You crazy Christian fundamentalist. What do you even mean by that? I mean, if demons are well, just it, it's playing like, the okay, role of God anyway, why does it matter? Yeah. Well, that people recognize let's say let's say let's let's give a simple example let's say uh, you're you're addicted to something i don't know yeah you, you you drink too much or i don't know whatever it is you watch porn or like you, you have this addiction right and you know that it's an addiction because it it because you can't control it right because you try to and then you can't and then it kind of pulls you and so that's a principality that that's that's also a principality 
That is, it's, it's a pattern in reality that is cosmic. It's cosmic because you're not the only person with that addiction, dude. Yeah. There are other people that also have that addiction. I mean, that that's not an idiosyncrasy to you. It's not yeah. just relative to you. It's an actual real pattern that exists in the world, but in which you are participating. And that, that you are not only participating, but that you, by engaging in these bad habits and these bad behaviors, you are feeding it. You're sacrificing your time and your attention to this pattern and you're making it stronger in the world because you're you're like a you're a branch of it you're a body for it you're a you know you're a tool for it to appear in the world right so it you don't need like a ghostbusters way of thinking like it doesn't have to be something like a woo woo science fiction thing this is just cognitive reality of how things work so that principality has a cosmic version of it it has to because it it doesn't just exist in you it exists in all these other people and so that's a demon and you can encounter it and you can be possessed by it and you can be a tool for it to spread in the world. Like, have you ever met someone who has a bad habit and is obsessed with getting other people to participate in that very bad habit? Oh, oh why? Yeah. They even know, they even know that it's bad for them. Like if you, if you pry them a little, you know that it's destructive. But nonetheless, they want to get that young kid to smoke and they're, they, they secretly want to get these teenagers to drink or to do whatever it is that, that they do. And so they're, oh. they're, they're a tool of this demon in the world. It's a real thing. I'm and, just getting flashbacks so it, because like you, it's so true. Like when people are so entrenched in their bad habit, let's say whatever, weed, drugs, and I've had these experiences where you're like, oh, I don't want any more. It's like, just have one, man. Just have one, just have one. Like they, they're like, and they even kind of, physically transform into that kind of orc demonic Golem. like just have one come on man just have one <laughs> and it's like dude no and then as soon as you try to break away from their lifestyle then they get like triggered and inflamed and like what do you mean what you think you're better than me you know and it's like whoa 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 man i just didn't want to do drugs that's all yeah no but you you've got the exactly the you've understood the right pattern and, <laughs> and so so these, so you can understand that, let's say, let's say, think about this. So there are principalities in the world that are trying to get your attention, right? There are some that are light and there are some that are dark and, you know, like all the good things, all, you know, like loving your neighbor, helping your friends, uh, you know, being good to your spouse, taking care of your children. There are all these light, these light patterns in the world and they are trying to kind of get your attention and you want to give your attention to them. And then you have all these darker ones that are there as well. Now you can understand these, these, these patterns as just abstract patterns in the world, but they, we are conscious beings. Like we are persons and those patterns end up coagulating into something like persons as well. And so that's why we, in the same way that I encounter you, a pattern thing in front of me, right? You're just a pattern but the, I encounter your face and your behavior as a pattern being that is the same for these higher principalities, you know? And so, and so you can, yeah, you can, like I said, you can encounter them. They can manifest themselves to you in sometimes in a more immediate way, depending on people's sensibilities. Um, but even if they don't, you can still understand that they're acting on you and, and, and you, you know, and like, let's say, I don't know if you've ever, you kind of free yourself from a bad habit. Let's say yeah. you have this bad thing that you're, that you're dealing with and you're able to free yourself from it. Um, and then when you're kind of free from it, you, you, you're even like, like, who is that guy who is doing that? You yeah. almost don't recognize yourself. Like you look at yourself and you're like, who's that guy that was doing this? Like, how is it that he was doing this? And you're like, you almost like you don't even, there's something about it that you can't even barely, you can barely recognize it. Of course, until the day, that you're like in a weak spot and then all of a sudden you don't, then again, you don't know what's going on. And it's like, yeah, you, know, you yeah. wake up and you're like back in the, in the pattern and you're thinking, how did I get back here? I thought <laughs> I was out of this thing. Like I thought I wasn't in there anymore. So yeah. how did I fall back you into this Wake thing? back into Satan's den. Exactly. <laughs> I said, exactly. I'll never do this again. And you're waking up with like 10 hookers around you, drugs. So you're yeah. like, Man, and you're what? like, what? Like, how did I get here? Exactly. And so like, but these experiences are real, like that everybody's had them. And so we can understand yeah. them just in terms of uh, psychology, but they're more than that. And, and, you know, ancient cultures and, 
and and Christian culture was able to recognize that this is not just idiosyncratic to you. These have objective reality, these patterns, and there are ways to deal with them religiously. And that something even like exorcism can actually have an effect on you in the same way that a coach, why is it that a coach who speaks to you before a game would make you better at playing basketball? Do you think that's, you don't think that's stupid? Well, why does it bother you that maybe someone with authority could, with spiritual authority could affect you in a way that would free you at least somewhat from that, from these different bad patterns that you have. So there are all these ways to kind of be able to look back and see again, these rituals, these practices that we see in, in, in ancient culture and just see how they, they're totally coherent. They're not at all, they're not strange the way they people told us they were. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And what I really appreciate about the Trinitarian view of God is that, well, three, the number three is actually the number of reconciliation, right? It transcends opposites and something I've been searching for so many years because mm. no matter what worldview I came to, there was always this dialectical tension. There's always this or it's that. Hermeticism actually did a pretty good job of explaining uh, like transcending duality and uh, dark and lightness and all this kind of stuff. And even in Hermeticism, they completely prove that you can't be God because of this, this and this. Mm. You know, and I found that very interesting because in this world today, we, well, either you don't believe in God or you believe you are God, which is mathematically the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that makes a lot of sense. And that's what you, you end up seeing. Well, we, it's more like, yeah, we're, we think we're like little gods, you know, and then yes. we kind of act that way. But usually if you observe someone who thinks that you realize that they're just, they're just a series of possessed, like they're just possessed by all these things, you know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you kind of see them <laughs> pop up when you're looking, when you're watching someone and all of a sudden you're like, Oh, 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 here comes, <laughs> here comes this thing. Like here it comes and you, you got to see it coming. It's easier to see it in other people, which is horrible. It's I know, to see it I know. Off, right? But, you, but it, it, it's true. You can see it. You're with someone and all of a sudden you can kind of see something coming out, you know, of them, some, some like obsession or some weird way of, interacting with others like you for example like you know you, you you watch a you know you have a friend a woman friend let's say and then you know you're engaging you're talking with her and then you go to a party and all of a sudden you see her like fall into like flirt mode and you're like what all of a sudden she's like a yeah. whole other creature and the way you're she like, moves what? and speaks exactly yeah, everything yeah, yeah. about her and you're like what is this like who's what's going on <laughs> this is like this being is is uh yeah is it's not the same being that i was dealing with you know an hour ago <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's why I like to just and constantly remind myself I'm just human. I'm always yeah, exactly. I'm fallible. I'm always going to fall. And it's, it's actually yeah. quite freeing to think that way versus yeah. you, are your, you are your own God and you can basically bend reality to your will. And I'm sure you can for a little while, but I don't know, man. I feel like there's always a, a price for everything. Yeah, it snaps back. Yeah, the bill it snaps back because to, yeah. there's 98% of you that you're not aware of so much of who you are, you're not aware of. Like, you know, in, in the Orthodox tradition, people wonder why that is, but we we're constantly confessing sins that we don't realize we've done. But we're constantly mm -hmm. saying, you know, wittingly or unwittingly, like yes. you know, confessing the sins that I've done, you know, on purpose or on accident, because there are aspects of my being that I'm not even aware of. And so people who think that they're, that they're kind of like these little gods, they don't realize that they have these little imps that are riding them. And, and so they, they kind of act and, and all of a sudden something happens like, you know, this, this aspect of themselves that they hadn't accounted for, you know, kind of springs forth and uh, yeah. And then they get, they get sideswiped, you know, so. Yeah. That, that, that's why community is so important. You know, having, I say this all the time, but I think it's good. It's very important to have good friends that will call you out on your BS. Oh yeah. You know, it's definitely. Just, being in your own lone world having spiritual experiences and yes gaining so much knowledge <laughs> just inhaling all that wisdom and you just yes i'm god <laughs> yeah exactly then you can't and recreating that reality yeah 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 exactly and can't oh, do normal man. human to human <laughs> interactions yeah but i get it too but i actually really wanted to dive into the like the book your brother's book yeah. but uh just maybe for those who aren't aware, what is heaven and earth? Like how do they? Okay, so yeah, so maybe with, like, my brother. I can just name for people. My brother is, is 
His name is Mathieu Pajot, so he's, he has a similar name. He wrote a book called The Language of Creation. And uh, my brother and I, we both kind of developed the symbolic thinking together when we were in our 20s. Um, and he, I would say he's kind of a, he's a far superior symbolist than I am in terms of his kind of grasp of patterns. And he's almost kind of mathematical in his, in his, in the way he sees things. Um, and so the way to understand uh, heaven and earth is almost in an Aristotelian way. It's like there's actuality and potential and there's, or you can see it like that there's invisible spiritual patterns mm -hmm. and then there is the potential for them to manifest themselves in multiplicity. And so that's what heaven and earth is. It's light and darkness, right? The good way to understand that. So light is that which reveals and then darkness is that which contains the the hidden bodies that will that will kind of sustain the light, you could say. Um, or it's also, uh, let's say, this idea of just invisible, these invisible spirit, like spirit is just wind in, in terms of the word. And so you have this kind of invisible movement, and then you have the waters below, let's say. And so that's what that's what heaven and earth is, at least in scripture, but not just in scripture. It's the same heaven and earth that you find in Uranus or Ga in Gaia or that you find in, in you know, in, in the Aboriginal uh, cosmologies and all these different cosmologies. It's, it's a pretty universal idea. Hmm. It's yin and yang. It's all that stuff. And how do you, how do you reconcile the kind of physical afterlife place of heaven, of what it says in the Bible? Yeah, well, the Bible doesn't say that you go to heaven. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so there's a difference between paradise and heaven. Okay. Oh man, I don't uh, even think about those. Yeah, yeah. I just assume yeah, so, that. So, so, so paradise thing. is the Garden of Eden, right? And okay. so, paradise is the paradise is the place where the balance between heaven and earth exists. It's the place between where the patterns and the their balance manifestation finds its its totality. So Christians don't believe that we go to heaven. They shouldn't. Some people do, but we believe that we'll be resurrected, that 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 Christ, that humans will be resurrected and that they will become a perfect union between the invisible and the visible, you could say. Hmm. That's the way to kind of understand the way that Christians understand spirituality. Now, you do see beings that go to heaven in scripture. For example, Elijah ascends into heaven. Mm -hmm. Christ ascends into heaven. And you see that, you know, St. Paul talks about, you know, it seems like he's talking about himself saying that he went up to the third heaven. And so heaven is this, the place where identities come from. And so it is possible for a being to, let's say, move into heaven. So a way to understand it, like, let, let me give an example of a being going into heaven. And so saints, you could say, to a certain extent, ascend into heaven. Okay. Because then they become patrons of things. And so let's say a saint moves up into heaven, and then now we have churches named after the saints. People will inter ask this particular saint to intercede for them regarding certain things. Let's say St. Mary of Egypt, for example. So St. Mary of Egypt is the saint people pray to when they're having sexual temptations. And so she's become, she's she is to a certain extent in heaven because now... She's she is becoming like an angel in the sense that she's like an invisible pattern by which we now congregate, that we come together and recognize, and then we that, and that we also kind of ask for her to help us in this aspect of reality. I don't know if that if that maybe helps to understand a little bit the difference. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, because I, ne I never even thought about the distinction between like paradise and heaven, but then there's also the. Uh, like what your brother talked about in the book about how heaven is abstract principles, basically, and where the purpose of humans are to inform meaning with matter and express matter through meaning, if I remember correctly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so that's exactly it. So it's like a two-way street. It's like you have these yeah. you have these principalities, which are invisible and are patterns, and then they find body in in potential. But then it's also matter, let's say, 
kind of expressing those those principalities. Like you need both of them to kind of happen together because because the abstract principles are useless without expression. Yes. So can, right, a, you can, ha- body, you can, can have a body an live, Can the soul live without a body, or is it for it to exist that has to have some sort of the? Uh, it has to have some attachment to body, yeah. Yeah. at least at least kind of eschatologically, like at least in the totality of things, it right. has to be attached to a body. That, except for, uh, of course, God doesn't. We could say everything is the body, like God's body is is the entire cosmos. That's maybe a way to understand it. But it, but uh, you know, even the angels are said to have subtle bodies. For example, that they don't have uh, material bodies, but they have subtle, subtler bodies. You know. Mm. Um, so a way to understand that is like a very simple way, very simple, simple way is that let's say you have an ideal and you're like, you know, I don't know, you're, you're some guy who's 250 pounds, you know, you, you're watching TV and, and you decide that you're going to become, you know, the sprinting champion of the world. And then, and it's like, okay. And you may, I don't know, you're 50 years old. It's like that pattern that you're looking towards can't, in, be embodied by you. It's actually not useful to you. That pattern is useless to you. That ideal, that abstract, let's say, direction that you are aiming towards, is is you can't embody it. And so you would you have you always have to find this relationship between, let's say, the the principles or the ideals or the things we're aiming for and the capacity we have to embody them. Hmm. But you can't you can't make a car out of grass. <laughs> it's not the proper body for that pattern. Challenge right? the accepted. body of the, the body of of a car has to be able to express the car. So yeah. matter has to express the principle, <laughs> and then principle and the car. The idea of a car is useless unless you can drive it. Like, I mean, yeah, it's nice to think about the idea of a car, but if, unless you can drive it, it doesn't. It's not going to have much use to you. So you have to be able to find reality is about finding the place where these things join together. Mm. And how does, uh, how does Christ join together between the material and the spiritual? How does this, how does the kind of triune God reconcile all of these paradoxes that we have compared to, let's say the idea of an impersonal God or pantheism, things like this. Well, the idea, like if you think about it like a mountain, you think about it like a hierarchy, and that's part of the okay. hierarchy. That's part of the this the way in which the world kind of lays itself out. When I talk about the pattern of attention, this idea of kind of moving, even the idea of moving towards the one, like as you're moving towards the one, that's what you're doing. You're you're moving out of quantity, or or let's say condensing quantity, so that you move up towards the towards the one, which is at the top, right? That's that's where one is if the world is like a, a mountain. So that point is something like ultimately cosmically, it would be the fulcrum, like the place where heaven and earth meets in a kind of absolute way. And then all the other places that heaven and earth meet, like the place where the idea of the car and the actual car meet, that would be somehow a consequence or down the hill from this ultimate place where heaven and earth meet and so that the idea is that that has different expressions in in uh in scripture you know the the mountain of paradise the mountain of moses where he goes up receives the law the tabernacle where you go into the holy of holies and you know you kind of you, you move from the quantity of the people into the one priest that goes into the holy of holies and then sees the glory of god so there are different versions of that in scripture and in not just in scripture, but in every religious tradition, there's all these different versions of it, ziggurats, uh, you know, all these different images. And but then the idea that what Christians are trying to help people see is that that ultimately is man, first of all, right? We are the place where meaning and the invisibles, we are like the laboratory where that happens. It's kind of through us that meaning appears in the world and so that's the one thing that you realize in someone like christ is that ultimately man is that place where that happens but then that man let's say the man that has that position will also manifest something and what he'll manifest is that he'll actually fill up the whole hierarchy 
he won't just be the top. He will actually contain the whole thing in himself. And so if you want to understand the story of Christ, that's what it is. That's why Christ has to die. That's why Christ is all these things. If you look at the way Christ is represented, he's, you know, he's all these opposites, actually. You know, he's a, he's described as a, as a, as a farmer in the sense of a agriculturalist. He's a, he's also a shepherd. He's the king. He's a, he's a priest. He's a workman. He's a slave. He's mm-hmm. a, he's a, he's a criminal. He's every aspect of reality that is kind of packed into his story. And then that, that, that kind of con- condensation of his story. And then it also like he, he fills the world up. That's why he heals things. Like he's always healing disease. He's always kind of, let's say at the top of the mountain and then healing that, which is below, right. Going to the stranger. Well, that's why he goes to prostitutes and publicans and all these marginal figures it's because he's going to the edge. He's moving out and kind of gathering all things into himself. Yeah. He, so, he would drink with go sinners. Into... He would drink with sinners, right? That's right. Go into these bars and just go to yeah. the Satan's den, hang out with the homies, meet And so he was able Yeah. But he was able to do that without because he contains all of this in himself. He was able to do that without losing himself, you could say. It's hmm. Like let's say most of us, if I went into a bar with a bunch of prostitutes, then maybe I would lose myself there. Right? Maybe I wouldn't be the one to to bring the prostitute into into the love of God, but I would rather, you know, find myself being dragged out into the, into the den of hell. And yeah. so that's the difference between the way that Christ, so when Christ encounters the prostitute, you know, she ends up, you know, washing his feet out of compunction for her sins and, 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 you know, wants to transform her life. And so you see the same, he goes to a tax collector who are these horrible, corrupt officials, you know, and, yeah. and, 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 and when he encounters them, they're like, I'm going to give my whole fortune to everybody and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to help the poor and I'm going to. So it's like Christ transform all transforms all these aspects of reality as he encounters them. So it's not just about hanging out with the with the with the people on the edge, but it's actually about transforming everything and bringing it into himself. So there's a million examples of how he does that. But ultimately, oh, yeah, sure. the death, the death of Christ. And the resurrection ends up being the ultimate image of that, like I said, which is that he goes down to the bottom of reality. He goes all the way down into death where everything is broken apart and everything is fragmented into its constitutive elements. And he then gathers all that up and then rises up, resurrects, and then ascends into heaven, right? But now by ascending into heaven, he's actually bringing everything into heaven with him. So it's an image of, gathering all of multiplicity all of death all of this everything into god Hmm. and so that's the that's what the incarnation is about and it's something which ultimately happens in all eternity right it happened at a moment in history but it's it's actually happening it's something which is a kind of a cosmic truth about how reality works it's not just something that happened it's actually revealing that you know you could say that reality is already and always reconciled in God and that Christ kind of manifested it at one point in the story, but th- this is actually how reality works. Mm. Well, there's a lot of, you know, old m- mythical stories of people, you know, dying and resurrecting and all that kind of stuff. But is Christ at least the first claimed person to have fulfilled that story in actual reality? I think so. I don't think I've seen another story where it's not just that, because people say he resurrected, but Christians don't just believe he resurrected. We believe that he gathered all of death into himself and brought it up, you know, into the Father. And so it's like, like I said, wow. there's no other story after that, right? It's like no. that's it. Like he basically <laughs> went into death and then gathered all of it, all of all of multiplicity, all the way to the to the constitutive elements, and then brought it up into heaven. And so I don't think that I don't, if anybody has an idea of another story like that, besides the story of Christ, I don't, I never heard it. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to know if there is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it's really, I find that symbolic story very interesting of, you know, Christ going down to Hades, defeating death and all that kind of stuff, because even people all around the world, when they get to really hard situations, and I've heard this of like an old, ch- uh, one of my best friends who lives in Chile, they have crazy earthquakes. And there was a time where he was like a materialist, atheist, socialist, 
But then when that earthquake came and he thought he was going to die, he went on his knees and prayed for Jesus. You yeah. know? And there's, there's a lot of those kind of situations where people they could be the most anti-christian person ever but man when you're in a crazy situation where you think you're going to die who else are you going to call I, I just find i always found that part interesting and i think that's kind of what made me curious to at least explore christianity yeah. is that special place that christ has uh because yeah. people don't call for buddha if they're getting attacked by demons you know uh and it's just it's interesting because people even I actually want to talk to you about UFOs because I found even that to be the case where certain people have a UFO experience, they'll call out to Christ and then <laughs> disappear. Oh, really? Yeah, I've never heard that story. I, I believe it. I'm not surprised. I, I think definitely. I haven't tested it, but I've heard. I've yeah, heard exactly. <laughs> I mean, it seems pretty obvious by now that there's at least a relationship between UFOs and uh, and kind of these dark these kind of dark principalities, you know, and, and you, and the relationship between UFOs and, uh, and also psychedelics seems to be coming clear and clear, let's say, um, you know, and, and it also, it seems like it's also part of the story. Like it's, have you ever seen, uh, Alistair Crowley's, uh, his demon, like the, 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 the creature that, um, supposedly dictated several of his books, it's his, his demon is called Eliath. It just Eliath. looks like it. Yeah, Eliot, so A-L-I-O-T-H. -A and Eliot looks just like a, like a gray, dude. He looks like a gray. Oh, that's and this creepy. is like this. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's the first image of something like that that anybody had kind of ever seen. Huh. Uh, but but he he has so he had this encounter, you know, and 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 Crowley and the OTO were were really hard, like they were trying to break things open. Like they were trying to kind of just remove the seals, you know. Um, and I think they probably were successful. And Breaking that's the part Siddles of the revelations, eh? <laughs> yeah, and part of the chaos of what we're seeing is maybe this kind of this opening that they participated in. And now there's a lot of this stuff kind of flooding through. Um, and so it's interesting that you say that 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 you've read stories of people who pray and then the UFO experience just vanishes. I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah same with sleep paralysis or uh, bad psychedelic trips, uh, yeah. th things like this. And again, these are people who you can't even say it's, oh, it's just placebo. Oh, it's just bias because it's a lot of times it's coming from people who, if anything, they're anti-Christian. So it's like, if any, you know what I mean? Like it makes no sense for it to have. But it's just funny. Like people it, imagine that. Imagine what you, what you said. And uh, like uh, I, uh, people, <laughs> people stop thinking. It's like they say it's just <laughs> placebo. It's just bias. It's like, OK, well, then why don't you call to Spider-Man? and see what happens and see if it's just placebo. It's like, yeah. that's not how reality works. It's not true. Maybe there's something placebo about it, but placebo is not arbitrary, even if that's part of it. It's like, you can't just call to anything and then it'll work. It's like, no, it has to be something that you believe in. And that's something which is powerful enough to kind of be there in your story, even though you deny it consciously. And yeah. so, and so, and so the idea of just saying it's like, oh, it's arbitrary, it's prejudice. Like, okay, dude, you don't understand how these things actually work. It's like, no, they're not. They, the, the reason why they would even work, even using the placebo argument is not arbitrary, right? Oh yeah. hundred percent. Even, like if the, some, even the word just like, oh, it's just, you yeah, that, I know that word. I hate that. <laughs> Every time someone said it's just that I'm like, okay, it's just no. a projection. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I've caught you. That's not, it's not possible. Like it's, think of the, think of the placebo effect, you know, think of, of the placebo effect. If you get, if you get a placebo from your doctor, right. You know, probably work. But if like a homeless guy walks up to you on the street and gives you a pill and says, this is going to cure your disease, man. Like, <laughs> it's not going to work. All right, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's yeah. not going to work. And so it's like placebo is not arbitrary. It has a, <laughs> it has a, it has a structure and it has a, it has a way to manifest itself and we can understand it. And it's actually part of reality. It's not, it's not something that you can just put to the side and say, this is not part of reality. It is because it works. Like it, it actually works. So. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what, what do you think of uh, these? Have you got delved deep into like s these psychedelic entities that people go into? Like, let's say, have you heard of the DMT jesters? No, I know a little or bit. The machine elves or these? Yeah, I know about the machine elves a little more. 
Yeah, what are, what are uh, your thoughts on that? Like, what is that? I find the very, I find the machine elf, I uh, let's say, I concept or the machine elf experience very. It's fascinating because, do you know? Like, do you know about the 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 traditions of uh, the Book of Enoch? You know a little bit about, about the Book of. I Enoch. don't. I know. I know a little bit about it. I haven't yeah. read it completely, but I'm, yeah. Basically. And so in the in the traditions of in the Book of Enoch, the Book of Enoch is a book. That was probably written in the second temple period and so it's like let's say a little bit before christ uh came but but refers to okay. tradition before the flood it is it non-canonical or okay. is it canonical so the story is that <clears throat> no i mean it's canonical in some it's canonical in the in the ethiopian church for example yeah. and uh and it remained kind of part of the it's quoted in scripture. St. Paul quotes the book of Enoch several yep. times. So the, so it's not it's not fully canonical, but it's kind of part of the lore, let's say Christian okay. lore. So in, in the book of Enoch, you have the, the descendants of Cain. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who develop technology, by the way, in scripture. You see that, that the descendants of Cain are, are the line which develop all technology. So music and then the arts and then cities and, and then metallurgy and weapons. All of this is developed by Cain. But in the mm. book of Enoch, you it expands on the idea that, you know, it says the sons of God went into the daughters of men, and then from that spawned giants. So in the book of Enoch, the idea Nephilim. is that these demons, these spiritual entities, come and they teach technical skills to humans. They teach them how to make metal, they teach them how to uh, how to make weapons, they also teach them magical skills like necromancy. And they even teach them, interestingly enough, uh, like uh, they teach women how to wear makeup, uh, which oh. is very interesting because interesting. It, it has to, yeah, it has to do with seduction. And it also has to do with kind of this um, using, using um, a covering to enhance something, which is what technology is. And technology is basically makeup. You could understand it as it's like, it's, it's like adding something to you in order to give you more power. Right. You can understand it because once you understand what makeup is, it can actually help you kind of get it, what huh. technology does. So, so the, these demons appear to the, uh, or it doesn't say how, but they mix with humans somehow. Okay. And then they teach these skills of making tech, tech, technology and weapons and, 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 uh, and makeup and all these things. Um, and that is, and the chimera is important too. So they, they teach them how to make hybrids, uh, like different kind of hybrids, human animal hybrids and, you know different different uh, uh animal hybrids um and that kind of the excess of that is what leads to the flood it's like basically things just break down and then here comes the the flood to kind of recapture the world and so the machine elves are super interesting because it just seems like it's playing out it's playing out the story of enoch it's playing out a book that was written thousands of years ago where people encounter these beings and these beings teach them or show them technological or technical patterns that some, I guess, some people are able to kind of apply in the world. And, uh, and so it's like the idea that our technology comes from aliens is actually, even though like the way that they do it in on the history channel is completely stupid and, and ridiculous, the trope of thinking that our technology comes from aliens is not completely stupid. If we understand aliens as, as just these, these kind of beings that that are able to kind of manifest patterns to people without discernment and then we kind of move into these these uh these kind of technological uh yeah so so i think that it's very fascinating because it seems to be playing along with what's going on and ai is definitely part of that you know the idea of these kind of embodied intelligences mechanically embodied intelligences like mm. all of this stuff is moving towards something like what we saw in in the pre-flood narratives you know seems like it I, and I, i've had experience with these uh kind of i don't know if they're machine elves but basically it was all of evil and darkness composed into one being but it had all these mechanical parts like this kind of soulless mechanistic just i don't know like no free will determinism but evil mm. Yeah, it's really, it's really bizarre. But when, because when I've gone through these experiences, I, I noticed then that these principalities, it's like they're more fundamental than us. You know what I mean? It's like a, a layer before creation or something like that. I don't know. I might, I might be 
crazy even saying this, but it really does feel so overwhelmingly real that I understand why people kind of get into it. But there's also, of course, the dark side of it. And yeah, I should exactly. be grateful that I tapped into the dark side early on and not, you know what I mean? Not tagged along until later in life. So yeah, that you, that you kind of saw it and said, okay, well, I need to think about this. Yeah. It's like basically hell scared, scared me back into heaven sort of thing. Mm. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. I want to go like whatever the opposite direction is to that. <laughs> I'm going that way and just live normal life, you know, just human, human life day to day. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think that's very important to be grounded, you know, cause I think when you get too lost in these spiritual dimensions without having the grounding, it can be more dangerous, you know, any spiritual practice. I feel yeah, like, definitely. you know, I feel like even Christianity could, oh, yeah. be, could be dangerous if you don't have that grounding. And I've seen it with people, oh, you're right. with people who get too inflamed with pride or something like that. And they become self-righteous like that typical, you know, I don't want to say that's a yeah, but even the mystical though. practice yeah. of the church, like in the Orthodox Church, we have a mystical practice which is called mm -hmm. hesychasm or the Jesus prayer, and it's a and it's a prayer which is repeated, uh, and then it's also uh, coupled with a breathing, with a kind of with a breathing which rhythms the prayer. You know, um, okay. And like how do, how do you do this? Is this just a quick thing? Is it like you breathe in, you say half the prayer, and then you breathe out? Yeah. You, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is like this is really kind of the the basic structure of of, uh, of of Orthodox mysticism, and everybody does the Jesus prayer, like everybody prays that. But there is an idea that some people will will pray the Jesus prayer in a manner that they become, or the prayer enters into their heart, and that they actually kind of the prayer takes over their being, and that they they kind of become just the prayer. And so hmm. th there's even this idea that at some point your heartbeat rhythms with the prayer and that your heartbeat becomes the the prayer and so the fathers will say don't do that like if you don't have a guide like if you don't have someone to guide you like do not do this it, it you will become insane like it will yeah. lead you to insanity if you go in this direction if you try to kind of do to pray without ceasing like to just kind of because this is the idea that they try to do is they try to the, the monks basically try to become constant prayer where their entire being is kind of caught up in this in this prayer uh and it leads to illumination it leads to theosis to basically being united with god but they tell you like don't do it without a, without a guy because it's super dangerous and it uh and it'll, it'll make you it drive you crazy and monks go wow. crazy you, become, you go to you go to these mon these monasteries you know let's say on monathos and you'll just meet crazy monks monks who lost their mind because they just weren't they became prideful or they just weren't being they didn't they didn't accept to be guided or they just did their own thing and then they just yeah. lose their mind. well it's funny how that that attitude is so universal because even in the psychedelic world let's say with ayahuasca uh, a lot of people are like no don't you dare do this without a shaman and then even to go beyond that it's like you got to be very careful which shaman you choose uh because again you're even in these new age practices, most reasonable people are aware that you are opening doors. You know what I mean? And you have to be very careful with what slips through. And yeah. even if something seems good, it might not be good. It's hard to know. Like, how can you explore these realms uh, smartly and safely? Or is it one of those best not to mess with that kind of stuff? Or it just depends on who you are as a person. <clears throat> I mean, I've never, I've never done psychedelics. So it's like I, I, I can't speak from experience. I, I feel like, let's see, from a from a more traditional perspective, it's definitely more on the dangerous side, in the sense that the idea of a real spiritual practice is to is to be transformed, right? It's to actually rise up in the hierarchy of being, is like through humility, not through pride, but like through humility and practice and 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 spiritual discipline that you actually become more like the angels become more like god and so it's not so much to just have these experiences of this world but rather to kind of participate and rise up in in the in the hierarchy of being you would say you see this image called the ascent of the divine ladder where yeah. you see uh monks going up a ladder and there's christ uh above and christ is the goal right you were we're actually aiming towards christ to become like him to be united with him 
Uh, and then there are angels that are kind of helping along the way. But then there are also demons. You see it in the image. Like these demons are like pulling the monks down and they fall into like the mouth of Hades at the bottom of the image. Um, and so the, their idea is not to either experience the angels or experience the demons, right? Their idea is to aim towards the transcendent, to aim towards Christ, aim towards the place where heaven and earth meet. Uh, and then you will encounter them along the way. But but that's not the per that's not the point. And so the problem with with I think with a lot of the psychedelic stuff is that people can rip open the veil and then move into this world and they have these experiences, but they're not better people. But they're not more. They're not freer from their from their own demons. They're not freer from their own passions. And so mm. yeah, so they're more in danger than they would be if they if they would just kind of stay in the normal world and. I say that, but look, I'd be honest with you. I know several people that 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 did psychedelics, and then converted, and then just became Christian. Uh, yeah, so it's not I've, like... heard, I've heard that. That's that's the thing that throws a wrench in the yeah. whole th thinking about this because I don't I don't have a sh necessarily a strong opinion of psychedelics or this or that because they're so mysterious and they have so mm. many different outcomes for different people. However, I would say that at the state that humanity is right now, it probably would be more dangerous than it is good. Uh, but I don't know if that's necessarily the psychedelics themselves, but just where humans are, because we're very prideful and very naive and can fall into these traps, you know? And also because we're materialists. And and so I can see it, like I can totally see it, because it's like, for all my love of Jordan Peterson, like I love Jordan Peterson, you know, but, but I think that this is one of the dangers that he's falling into, it's because it's easy to you can you can analyze it right it's a mushroom mm -hmm. it's like here's the <laughs> chemical formula yeah. right here's the thing it's right there just take it you eat it and there you go so it's like it's super easy so so the most materialist the most scientific person can say like mm. this is like it's it's it this this works it's a pill you take it you have this experience you can analyze it you can calculate it you can you can look at the person's brain and you can see their waves, whatever it's going on. And so, and so it seems like a kind of materialist shortcut, you know, yeah. to the spiritual life. Uh, but I think that that's also why, why it's a problem. Like, I think that that's why it's a problem is because, you know, look at, look at even like at the way that, uh, I don't know if you saw that discussion you had with the guy who wrote this, uh, this what is it like the i forget what it is like something about how mushrooms are at the source of our religions or whatever some book about that oh uh, yes um, yeah, i actually had him on yeah yeah uh the immortality key is that right i think that's yeah. what, I, maybe that's what it is i don't know but look at look at what they're doing it's like so so think of the mysteries of release you, you elusis for example mm -hmm. right so you have this entire ritual that lasts several days and is extremely engaging and is like sworn to secrecy. You're not allowed to talk about it. There's a whole thing around the entire mystery of, of Eleusis. And then maybe at some point in this thing where they come, let's say, to the to the edge of it, then there's a substance involved in the experience. But mm. now the materialist wants to just say, all that ritual stuff, it's all bullshit. It's the, it's the mushroom. It's yeah, it's the mushroom, formula. dude. <laughs> like it's the formula yeah. that I can analyze and that I can show you and that I can, I can measure and I can, and so, and so it's, it's just such a materialist way of, of looking at, at reality uh, that even if maybe in some, in, in some cultures, psychedelics were part of the process of transformation of the person, the idea that they were the central part of it is complete nonsense. Hmm. It's complete nonsense, and and it, and it's and it's super dangerous, and it's such a it's like a materialist way of approaching you know these 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 ancient myths, these stories, these these patterns of transformation, and and I anyway, so I I tend to really be very cynical about about this stuff. Hmm. Well, even Carl Jung was cynical about it. And it's, cause I, I, it's funny because even myself, a lot of psychedelic people quote Carl Jung, like yeah. he's our, our Lord and Savior, but even he's like, yeah, beware of unearned wisdom. Don't do psychedelics. Pretty much. He didn't say those exact words. He did say yeah. beware of unearned wisdom, but he was very, but then again, man, he went through like a 10 year psychosis. So it's like, yeah, I don't need to open any more doors. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely definitely yeah he also had i think that problem where he wasn't he didn't accept to be guided you know hmm. and uh and there are there are stories about jung like 
uh, you know, even, even like from a, even not, even from a, not a Christian perspective, you know, there are stories of him, you know, going to India, but all but then refusing to even to be guided by the supposed masters that he encountered there hmm. and that he wouldn't even meet with them. Like he was just, he's a scientist. Like in the end he ended up. And I think that, that he didn't like, yeah, he just, he was never like, he, he, I don't think he ever ended up being either a practicing Christian or an initiate of anything. He was just hmm. someone from the outside who was trying to explain these things. And then, got cracked open you know <laughs> just got cracked open is the only way to oh, see it oh man C- could you imagine so, that like going to bed sleeping with a revolver under your pillow and having these attacks by these entities every day i'm surprised he didn't like end up killing himself man that, that's like yeah that, that sounds like hell to me but i'm glad that he got some knowledge out of it and came out the other side thank god yeah yeah well, yeah, <laughs> yeah well <laughs> yeah. it's what it is uh yeah, Jonathan, I would love to uh, just finish this off because I know that you make a lot of videos about like symbolism, unpacking movies and stuff. Do you ever do video games? It's funny because everybody's been asking me to do video games forever. And, you uh, should. <laughs> and then I did. I did a video. Which it was probably because it, it's also maybe I didn't approach it the proper way. Okay. I, thought, I thought, okay, so what? what I should talk about an early video game to show the pattern and kind of how it was there from the beginning. Let's say even the more complicated games. Yeah, like Super had, Mario? Yeah, so actually, so I did it on Donkey Kong because I was moving towards oh, Super Mario. Like the old, so did a video old school on, Donkey Kong. I did it a video yeah. on a video on Donkey Kong and it just totally bombed. Like nobody watched it. Huh. Uh, and then it discouraged me because I wanted to do it on Donkey Kong and then do it on Super Mario uh, as a kind of second, a second step to show how it's all there in Donkey Kong, but then it kind of unfurls into Mario and then the day Mario becomes the becomes like the template for basically all the games we have now. Uh, but uh, but yeah, but then I just never made the second video because it was because it was a lot of effort to kind of to, to 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 put it together and to write it and to edit it and then uh, yeah. and it, so you can find it the Donkey Kong video if you okay. want. I I think it was pretty good. Like I was happy with it. I'll, but uh, maybe I'll, I will. I'll like I out. might do it. Maybe. Maybe you can even do like a uh, something that I would enjoy anyways, seeing you do like a reaction video to one of the more popular games like Skyrim or something like that, one of these epic yeah. kind of fantasy worlds that people are, com- are completely obsessed with that have really cool stories and symbolism. Yeah. Well, I think that like Elder Scrolls, I think they definitely do a good job at kind of containing a world. Like they, they yeah, present sure. a world that is that is quite... Is both very diverse, but also coherent enough that it really fits in that. Almost, it fits a little bit in that kind of Tolkien. Uh, Tolkien is the one who set, by the way. Tolkien oh, is the one who 100%. set who set the map for all of these things. Like, especially yeah. for especially for the, the 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 fantasy video games or the world building video games. It's really Tolkien who kind of set the standard for that. Uh, but but for sure, in, in in Elder Scrolls, they do a good job at let's say embodying it. You know. Um, so, so yeah, I think so, but it's just hard because let's say something like Skyrim, it's like, it's so big, yeah, it's, like it's hard to hours. talk about it's yeah. like this huge, huge game. Even the story itself is really big. And so it, I think it would, I think it'd be difficult to do like a kind of consent. Or, or break it down, maybe like do, breaking down, like literally one mission of a certain story. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you're maybe just choosing one and then See and, how it goes, man. showing it I pattern. Think, I think it could explode. Skyrim is very popular. You're very good at unpacking these kind of myths. So <laughs> just an idea. You don't have to do anything, but it's something. No, 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 <laughs> no. But it's, it's not, it's something that it's been, it, obviously people have been asking me to do video games for a, uh, for a while, for a long time. And so who knows, maybe, I don't know. It's possible. It's also, <laughs> it's like, there are so many things to do too. So it's hard to, it's hard to sometimes decide what i'm gonna do yeah i know you want to do all these things at once uh yeah, exactly. well, why why do people play something that i've been fascinated with is why do people are obsessed with horror games and stuff like that like why do people go out of the way to pay money to scare the crap out of themselves so why do people why do people uh, like pay horror? horror yeah just in horror in general it's something that's been yeah. very fascinating for me okay well horror like horror is, how can I say this? Horror is a reality. There's a, there's a relationship. There's a little bit of a relationship between something like 
sacred space and horror in the sense that horror is a category, it's always a category which transcends the rational, right? Horror is like the irrational, which just kind of smashes against the world. Right, right? like that primal adrenaline sort of thing. Yeah, but also it's like something which is, is unreasonable, right? It's, it doesn't make sense, right? Hmm. The, even the idea of a mass killer doesn't doesn't make sense and then the more imagistic versions of that i don't know, like evil dead or whatever like these kind of these kind of this encounter with these these really really kind of irrational forces that are extremely cruel and that are extremely violent and, 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 and that are basically will just destroy the world it's something that it's something that is that can make us peek into the idea that there's something beyond the rational, right? It's called, it's kind of like in the, it's kind of like in the wrong direction, you could say, but not totally. Because if you look at Christianity, horror is part of the sacred, right? The cross is in part, it's not just horror, but it's, it is horror. Horror mm -hmm. is in the cross. There's other things going on in the cross, but, mm -hmm. but horror is there. And so um, I think the difficulty with horror is that it, it, it's just in one direction, let's say. It's more about kind of encountering the monsters on the edge of the world, you could say. It's something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but, but, I, but it's, not, it's not completely, uh, it's, not, it's understandable. Because if you, if you read even the idea of uh, there's a relationship between awe and terror. Okay. They're just in the experience. So think about like, I mean, you can imagine it like a, just in a primordial experience of kind of <clears throat> encountering a giant warrior, right? And this giant warrior like steps out in front of you and you're like, I don't know, you're an 11 year old boy. This like six foot five massive warrior with a helmet like just steps out in front of you. It's like, you're gonna be a lot of things. You're gonna feel a lot of things when that happens. You're gonna feel scared impressed overwhelmed like let's say frozen in front of this like this this revelation let's say and so you get so that's when you can kind of understand this idea of the relationship between let's say the terror of encountering god or encountering an angel you know the re like the joke on the internet, right? Right, the biblically accurate angels. Like, there's something about that that is that the the, yeah, the that. angel says when the angel says, "Be not afraid." Like the reason why he's saying "be not afraid" <laughs> is because he's scary as hell. Like that, that, that means, yeah, yeah. Don't right, be afraid. Angel, it's, like, uh, <laughs> it's like whoa. Yeah. The angel appearing to you is something like a breaking open of normal space and this like this like rushing in of of this transrational space, and so. There is an aspect of it which is, which is going to be kind of terrifying, and so it's normal, I think. So that's why you hear the angels say that because it's like they're also trying to signal to you which, which yeah. side of this, let's say, which side of this uh, encounter that you're dealing with, you know. Oh, that's so true, man. Uh, those biblically uh, accurate angels are like, whoa, that's like, yeah. They're not really like, biblically accurate. They're they're going on purpose to like make them really wild. But like in in the in the Orthodox uh, version of angels, you kind of see, you see uh, something of that, right? You do have the image of the cherub with the four heads, and then the these these wings with eyes on them. Yeah, so yeah. these are iconographic, like there are iconographic versions of these of these beings, uh, or like the wheels with wings and eyes and stuff. Um, but some of the memes, like they just go on purpose to make them look almost like a yeah. It's like there's a little bit of a sensationalism let's say in that for sure for sure yeah. but yeah any, anyways jonathan i I'll, won't leave you any longer i really appreciate you coming on the podcast uh we had some very interesting discussions it was awesome. good to meet you and i wish you all the best on your on your journey for sure yeah thank you thank you it's definitely been an interesting one it's a long very long journey because it's not like a sensationalized one where you have like an experience you're like oh yep i'm a christian some people do have those experiences yeah but for me it's been a very long process of elimination kind of journey i guess i get it yeah well yeah so i wish you all the best on that and also in your kind of crazy world of lockdowns you know 
Oh I, man, we can wish we can wish for the best. Save know, us, Jonathan, so. please get me out of here. <laughs> I wish. I, I want to leave. I really want to leave. Yeah, I feel the same here. So it's not as bad as you, but I kind of I'd like I have all these friends saying, you know, come to Texas, come to Florida, come to Tennessee or uh, whatever. Like all these, I wish these other states, but yeah. Well, all we can do is prepare for the worst and hope for the best. I guess. That's right. Yeah. But, exactly. But yeah. Anyways, I, thanks again for coming on the on the podcast and yeah hope to catch up with you sometime in the future great yeah and send me the link if you when you put it up i'll share oh, it. oh for sure for sure awesome all right, all right jonathan all, right, all the best bye. god bless bye